Revenge is a popular subject of cinema, of drama, of art. Lots of good revenge stories out there. The Crow is probably my current favorite. On paper, I don't think the story should work, but it does. A dude and his girlfriend are brutally murdered by four thugs the night before Halloween, and then he comes back a year later as an immortal goth, and then spends the rest of the film hunting down those four goons and their crime lord ringleader. Halloween ain't till manana. But where exactly is the tension supposed to come from? He literally can't be killed. Are we really supposed to wonder whether or not he's gonna manage to pull it off? Shit. Oh, shit on me. But then I guess the best revenge stories aren't really about kill counts. They were about closure. We know he's probably gonna kill everyone who had a hand in him and his girlfriend's death, but is it gonna bring him any peace? Just how does an immortal goth process grief? That, I think, is a compelling narrative. And this one's told with a stellar soundtrack, an iconic production design, and a standout roster of some of the industry's best character actors. But then The Crow is sort of the exception that proves the rule. I don't like very many revenge stories. Or if I do, the revenge element is usually the thing I find the least compelling about them. Like I like Kill Bill, but more as an exercise in style over substance. I think The Count of Monte Cristo's great, but I see that more as a story about reinvention than revenge. I also have a soft spot for Spawn, but not because of the plot. I'm not the vindicator, or the victimizer, or the vaporizer, or the vibrator. The vast majority of revenge thrillers sort of just... I, I have a hard time connecting with the protagonists. Like, these people have all suffered some of the most horrible injustices that human minds can even imagine, right? But then that makes their motivation so extreme that I usually have a hard time identifying with them. It's like, well, if my whole family were gunned down at a beachside family reunion by the family of the mobster that I helped kill, then yeah, I'd probably want to crack some skulls too. Good thing I'm not a cop. But for whatever it's worth, I consider this my problem. Something for me to work on. Maybe I'm just not suspending my disbelief hard enough. I mean, I shouldn't have to experience exactly what a protagonist is going through in order to empathize with them. But that doesn't change the fact that I just don't spark to that many revenge movies. Except three. There are three revenge stories that I just can't get enough of. I count them as some of my all-time favorites. I've wanted to do a video about them for a while now, but first I had to figure out why I like them so much. And I think it's because they're not just stories about revenge, they're meditations on and deconstructions of the very notion of vengeance itself. Pumpkinhead is a folk horror cult classic from 1988. It tells the story of Ed Harley, a backcountry widower who lives in a ramshackle farmhouse with his young son Billy, whom he adores. Great grandmama used to wash my hands, and she was so old that the skin on her hands was thin as tissue paper. It felt so good. Ed operates a feed and supply store along the highway and regularly takes Billy there with him. Leaving hope, huh? I know writers who use subtext, and they're all cowards. But then one day, Ed has to leave Billy behind to go run an errand, and while he's gone, a group of rabble-rousing city kids accidentally run Billy over with a dirt bike. The offending writer Joel quickly panics and takes off. It was an accident, I almost hit him myself. Yeah, but I've been drinking. They'll fry me. But it's not like the rest of the kids just pull in I know what you did last summer and leave. There's no phone at the feed store, so most of them pile into the car to go call for help. And Joel's brother Steve actually stays behind to look after Billy until Ed comes back. But by the time the other kids catch up to Joel, he's already ripped the phone out of the wall. Damn you! And when Ed finally returns to find Billy, let's just say he's less than grateful for Steve's efforts. We saw him, it was an accident. But can I help? This moment right here makes me wonder whether revenge is the most rational response to injustice or the most irrational. Like, I have no idea. Who's the rational responder here? 
Is it Steve, who's desperately trying to contextualize the circumstances of a negligent tragedy that wasn't his fault? Or is it Ed, who couldn't possibly feel any better about the situation no matter what the explanation is? I have no clue. So Ed carries Billy's broken body back to his farmhouse, where Billy's death is practically a formality. Ed is inconsolable. So inconsolable, in fact, that he takes Billy's body deep into the woods and asks the local witch Haggis to raise him from the dead. And when Haggis says she can't do that, Brave raising the dead ain't within my power. Ed asks for what he figures is the next best thing. Folks used to talk about you, says how you do things. When a man had been wronged, he could come to you and you called upon this thing. In that man's name, and that man, he'd be avenged. Haggis warns Ed that the cost of revenge is much steeper than he might expect. What you ask, got a powerful prize. But Ed doesn't care. They killed my boy. They won him over. And they left. So Haggis gives him some instructions. There's an old graveyard. Way back, deep in the woods. Bring a shovel. Thing you're looking for. It's in there. Bring it back here. This he does. Bring it here. And after a few incantations and subsequent blood offerings, Haggis summons the evil demon of vengeance Pumpkinhead. Just a heads up, spoilers from here on out, for all three of the tales we're going to be talking about today. Now personally, I don't think that knowing how these stories end is going to ruin your interest in watching any of them, but I still want to make sure everyone knows what they're getting into so that everyone can make the decision that's right for them. Okay? So once summoned, Pumpkinhead promptly gets down to business, but not in the way that you might expect. Unlike most horror movies, the order in which Pumpkinhead kills actually matters. He starts by killing Steve, the only person in the group who stayed behind with Billy after he got hurt. The only reason Ed even knows what happened to his son, the person who did the most to make amends. But those efforts buy him no grace. Steve's death is protracted and painful. Pumpkinhead seems to delight in prolonging the agony, not just Steve's, but the rest of the kids as well. Pumpkinhead has this habit of returning corpses back to the others once he's finally finished them off. He follows up his first kill with Steve's girlfriend Maggie, the most religious member of the group. First he carves a cross into her face and then taunts the others with her broken body before finally killing her too. One gets the sense that Pumpkinhead really enjoys his work. He seems to revel in taunting and teasing his victims, right down to the sadistic little smirk on his face. But then that's exactly what Haggis said he would be. Cruel, devious, pure as venom, bench. Cruel and devious indeed. But then that begs the question, does vengeance require cruelty? I mean, I know we all expect a little twisting of the knife. I mean, after all, someone has been thoroughly wronged. But is it actually necessary? What would cruelty-free vengeance even look like? Something a bit more dispassionate? A bit less reactionary? A bit less pleasurable, maybe? No! See, that sounds to me like just good old-fashioned justice. Whereas vengeance is usually in response to justice deferred. Someone escaping justice. Plus, vengeance is usually committed by the wronged party, as opposed to some legislative authority. So there's usually an element of schadenfreude involved. But how much twisting is too much twisting? At what point does revenge go from just an especially personal form of justice to its own kind of evil? For Ed Harley, it's no more than two deaths. After Steve and his girlfriend die, Ed realizes this isn't what he wanted. He has heaped coals upon the heads of his enemies, and it proves to be too much. He quickly goes back to Haggis and begs her to call it off. You gotta stop it. But that's not possible. Nothing I can do. He's gotta run his course now. So Ed decides now he's gonna do everything he can to try and save the remaining kids, even if it's the last thing he does. Send it back to whatever hell it come from. It's a pretty wild about face, especially for the 1980s. This was the missing in action era. 
1988 was the same year that Rambo 3, Death Wish 4, and Dirty Harry 5 all came out. The protagonists of these films were not in the habit of second-guessing the purpose and consequences of vigilante violence. But Ed Harley does. And it's not just that Pumpkinhead was killing the wrong people that made him reconsider. Ed tries to stop Pumpkinhead from killing Joel. Ed recognizes something incredibly reactionary in his quest for revenge that he never gets to fully articulate by the end of the film. We're simply left to infer that such a reactionary response to injustice isn't just unhelpful. It's not even personally satisfying. But then what if your quest for revenge is personally satisfying? We let you both live. And you've wasted it! The second tale I want to talk about today isn't actually from a movie. It's from a video game. We could have killed you. Maybe you should have. The Last of Us Part 2 is a third-person stealth survival horror game from 2020. <laughs> Shit. Which also happens to be my second or third favorite video game of all time. I've beaten it four times in the two years since I bought it, which is a lot for me. I can count on one polydactylic hand the number of games I've beaten four times total, much less four times in two years. What was especially fun about my playthroughs was that I beat it twice right before I actually moved to Seattle, which is a hell of a way to be introduced to a new city. The first time I saw the Seattle Convention Center in real life, I was like, oh, I have done some dark deeds in here. All right, just don't. I still haven't visited the eastern suburbs, in part because of what happens when you go there in the game. This is an M-rated game, by the way, so you're gonna see some N-rated stuff if you keep watching. Just a heads up. Now at some point, I might go ahead and do a full review of the actual game. <laughs> But for the purposes of this video, we're only going to talk about the story, which is one of only four or five video game stories I've ever played that I don't think is simply wasting the player's time. Now, The Last of Us Part Two is indeed a sequel, so in order to properly contextualize it, we got to talk about what came before. Major spoilers from here on out. In The Last of Us Part One, you play as Joel, a gruff, disillusioned mercenary type who's just trying to make a living amidst the zombie apocalypse. Sorry, Cordyceps apocalypse. Cordycepalypse? They're infected by a fungus. Anyway, after a brief prologue that introduces you to Outbreak Day and some of Joel's traumatic past, the game begins in earnest 20 years later when Joel reluctantly agrees to escort plucky teen Ellie out of Boston. But before they're even beyond the city limits, he learns what makes her so special. Look at this. I don't care how you got infected. It's three weeks old. No, everyone turns within two days, so you stop bullshitting. It's three weeks, I swear. The rest of the game follows Ellie and Joel as they cross the country trying to find a secret research facility in Salt Lake City, run by an underground paramilitary resistance movement known as the Fireflies. The Fireflies intend to develop a cure for the infection from Ellie's unique biochemistry. Over the course of the game, Ellie and Joel go from reluctant partners to codependent survivalists to a little two-person created family that's hard not to compare to a father-daughter relationship. But when they finally reach Salt Lake City, we'll Joel forever. learns the horrible truth. If the Fireflies are going to try and cure the What's zombie the outbreak, they'll first they'll need to remove the Ellie's brain. The vaccine. But it grows all over the brain. It does. As far as the Fireflies are concerned, this is a foregone conclusion. Their leader informs Joel as a mere courtesy after Ellie is already anesthetized for surgery. But whatever it is you think you're going through right now is nothing to what I have been through. I knew her since she was born. I promised your mother I would look after her. Then why are you letting this happen? Because this isn't about me, or even her. Joel remains unpersuaded. I said keep walking. Like, it's not even up to the player to decide what Joel's gonna do next. It was the operating room. I ain't got time for this. His decision Where? is also a foregone conclusion. Where? Top floor. And the last level of the game sees you blasting your way through Firefly headquarters in order to rescue Ellie. I'm simplifying a lot of things for the sake of expediency, 
Like, I didn't even tell you about Pittsburgh, which brings me to tears each and every time I see it. But suffice it to say that if The Last of Us Part 2 is one of my all-time favorite video game stories, The Last of Us Part 1 is surely one of the others. Swear to me that everything that you've said about the Fireflies is true. I swear. Part 2 picks up four years after the first. Ellie is now 18 years old and living within the relative safety of Jackson, hey, Wyoming. Morning. Like, the zombie apocalypse is still raging outside, but there are little pockets of civilization that have finally achieved some sense of stability. Hey, old timer. Yeah, get a good scratch. You don't get long to enjoy it, though. The Last of Us Part 2 starts off with one of the most brutal first act twists in recent memory. A group of paramilitary survivalists known as the Wolves, led by the mysterious ringleader Abby, has tracked Joel down with some unspecified, very personal grudge against him. When Ellie finds out Joel hasn't checked in for too long, she goes looking for him, and catches up with him here. Please stop! Please don't shoot! Joel, please get up! <laughs> the wolves spare Ellie's life, and she promptly vows revenge. The rest of the game follows Ellie and three of her friends as she makes her way to the wolves' base of operations in Seattle, and then proceeds to track down and kill as many members of the group as possible, slowly but inexorably closing in on ringleader Abby. Point to where she is on this map, and then you... It better fucking match up. Each level of the game inflicts new physical and psychological tolls on Ellie. At one point, Ellie tracks down one of the women from the original group who knows Abby's whereabouts. You remember me? But she doesn't want to talk. Yeah. You remember me. So Ellie chases her through a hospital, knocks her down into a zombie-infested basement, and then tortures her in order to learn Abby's location. This moment got some critical flack in the trades for forcing the player to initiate the torture themselves instead of giving said player any say in whether or not it actually takes place. Whereas I'd argue, sure it does. You can either hit square to torture this dying woman or shut the game off. Like that's the choice. If Ellie doesn't find out where Abby is, the game is over. But just when Ellie finally finds out where Abby's been hiding, Abby gets the drop on her. You killed my friends. We let you both live. And you wasted it! The game then literally cuts to black and winds the clock back. You then play as Abby for the second half of the game. Oh, shit. See, the reason Abby was so hard to track down over the previous three days was because she was on an epic quest of her own. First, she goes looking for her ex-boyfriend Owen, who's rumored to have defected from the wolves. And along the way, she falls in with two kids who are on the run from a survivalist death cult known as the Seraphites, who are themselves engaged in an ongoing guerrilla war against the wolves. It's interesting to play this half of the game after having played through the first half as Ellie, because in the first part, all these people are just names on Ellie's kill list. But in the second half of the game, we actually learn who they all were, what they had going on in life, their hopes and dreams, likes and dislikes, right before they all die. That game good? Really hard. I felt really good. That's a great tunes too. This random guy that Ellie shoots in the aquarium turns out to be like the main supporting character of the second half. Oh, and you also find out why Abby hated Joel so much. You don't get to rush this. Her father was the doctor that Joel killed back in Salt Lake City in order to save Come Ellie. Here, girl. I gotcha. At the end of her own quest, Abby winds up siding against both the wolves and the Seraphites in order to protect the kids, and turns her back on the wolves when she sees what they do to the kids' family. But by the time Abby's quest is finally over, all of her friends are already dead. Abby then learns where Ellie's hiding and decides to get the drop on her. You fucking people. And then we finally get to see how this terrible showdown plays out. Stop! 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 She had nothing to do with this. She's pregnant. Good.
Up until this point in the game, there had been brief smatterings of doubt expressed as to the nature and efficacy of Ellie's mission. Ellie's girlfriend Dina and good friend Jesse both question her about the frustratingly cyclical nature of revenge. An eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind and whatnot. I mean, we're going through a lot of their people. In their city. Because of what they did. Didn't Abby and her friends come to Jackson because of something Joel did? This place isn't like Jackson. I mean, Joel and Tommy helped Abby when she got attacked. These people are trying to kill everyone around them. I mean, they shot you on sight, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Joel kills a bunch of fireflies, the wolves kill Joel, Ellie kills the wolves. And then what? At what point does it stop? What dictates the conclusion? Is there any logical end point? Or does it just end when everyone's either too tired or too dead to keep going? Ellie is now reaping exactly what she sowed. This is precisely what people warned her about when she first decided she wasn't going to let Joel's killers go. You have no idea what you're walking into. It's true that nobody wanted Abby to just get away with it. So they just get to get away with this? <laughs> nobody wants that. Yeah, but that's what's happening. But calling Ellie's quest for vengeance a simple balancing of the scales of justice doesn't feel right either. There's just too much collateral damage involved. And even if her quest for revenge hadn't cost her so much, it was never going to bring Joel back. Good night, kiddo. So if we're going to call what Ellie sought justice, I think it needs a qualifier. She's seeking punitive justice. She seeks to punish those that did her wrong. Well, yeah, I hear some of you say. I mean, what's the alternative? Oh, we'll get to that in a minute. What happens next only makes sense if you know what kind of week Abby's just had. She's pregnant. Good. Abby! Abby has just been through several cycles of violence herself, and came out the other end with far less than what she went in with. <coughs> Don't ever let me see you again. If all you knew was Ellie's side of the story, this would feel like deus ex machina. Bad guy had a magical change of heart. But instead, it feels like... catharsis. Catharsis for Abby, anyway. Because that's not the end of the story. Fast forward several months. Ellie and Dina have returned to Jackson and are raising Dina's baby on a farm. But their escape from Seattle has brought Ellie anything but closure. She still suffers from terrible PTSD. Come on, little dude. <laughs> then Tommy shows up with a report of someone matching Abby's description down in Santa Barbara. And again... Ellie wonders if she can live with letting Abby walk free. She never got to make that choice back in Seattle. She never got to punish Abby for what she did to Joel. And if the point of punitive justice is to simply punish the perpetrator, then justice has not yet been served. At this point in the game, I was practically shouting at the TV. Not because I think this story is stupid, but because of how much Ellie is still risking. It's like Seattle never even happened. But then this part of the story is still necessary, because the tale is still critically incomplete. It would feel pretty asymmetrical to watch Abby go through this whole journey and then finally decide whether or not she was going to spare Ellie, only to then deny Ellie the chance to make the same choice. In the last level of the game, Ellie fights her way through hordes of infected and a gang of slave-keeping cannibals known as the Rattlers, and then in the last act, she finally catches Abby right where she wants her. I like how for a second here, it looks like Ellie's just gonna let her go. There goes this way. But then... We 
I can't let you leave. I like how this works as a boss of the game fight, because even though it's pretty anticlimactic on a technical level, it's still one of the most intense fights I've ever been in on an emotional level, virtual or otherwise. And in the end, It's worth noting that a lot of people hated this ending. While the vast majority of critics agree that the story is something of a masterpiece, there was a vocal minority of critics and players who absolutely hated it. And that's fine, but I don't think some of the more common complaints are actually supported by the text. Like, some people interpreted the ending to mean, oh, Ellie refused to avenge the murder of her adoptive father because revenge bad. But that's not what happened here. Ellie does decide to let Abby live, but she critically, critically, doesn't say why. That's not just a fun fact, it's critical to a proper understanding of the text. We don't get to know why Ellie spared Abby's life, saved Abby's life really, because this is not the kind of story where you get to know that. I think a lot of people jump straight to the whole she just decided revenge is bad conclusion because they're used to their media trying to moralize to them. Either that or they think they need to moralize their own media before they decide whether or not they like it. And I think both approaches miss the point, or are even actively harmful. It's not any story's job to tell us how to behave. It's not our job to declare the actions of the characters right or wrong. I'd argue it's not even any story's job to tell us why their characters do the things they do. Not in every case. All we really need is a plausible excuse. And then we're free to make up our own minds. You want to know why I think Ellie didn't kill Abby? It's what I said before. Because revenge isn't about kill counts. It's about closure. I don't think Ellie finally had Abby right where she wanted, and then suddenly decided that revenge killing is wrong. I think she finally had Abby right where she wanted, and then worried that killing her might not make her feel any better. And not because it'd be morally wrong. What if she killed Abby and everything still hurt just as much as the day Joel died? There's nothing to do after Abby's dead. Nobody left to punish. All she'd have left is everything she lost. There goes this way. In my opinion, this quest was Ellie's attempt to supplant the grieving process. She pretended she was seeking justice, but I think with the massive amount of collateral damage involved, it's easy to see that this was never about balancing the scales. It was white-hot rage and guilt and sorrow that never got the chance to properly grieve. I don't think the story necessarily begs us to wonder what Ellie might have done instead, but just for the sake of argument, what might she have done instead? What could she have prioritized instead of just personal vengeance? There is a condescendingly simple answer in the third and final tale we're going to talk about. And this one doesn't even have any murder. And it would be an honor to me to take him out. <gasps> no, no, Uncle Carmine, no, don't you dare. More of the garbage is my problem. I'll work it out myself somehow, thanks. Thanks for the thought anyway, though. What? All right, what? What are we saying? What do we want? Revenge? No, we are not talking about revenge. No, I am talking about justice. I've summarized the plot of First Wives Club in at least one video before. I think two videos before. But for those who don't know, First Wives Club tells the story of Annie, Elise, and Brenda, three 50-year-old former college friends who've fallen out of touch in the intervening decades and are all being screwed over in some way by their estranged husbands. Brenda's husband, Morty, is going through a midlife crisis and has left her for a 20-something socialite. What's the matter, Morty? Can't you buy her a whole dress? Elise's husband, Bill, has been leeching off her career for decades and now wants alimony. I produced these films. You knew nothing about films when I met you. I taught you everything. What? Those were good years, Elise. Your best. 
and Annie's husband Aaron is pretending like he wants to repair their relationship while sleeping with their therapist. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh, this is very awkward. No, 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 Annie was just leaving. The three of them are thrust back into each other's lives when their old friend Cynthia, who has similarly been divorced recently for a much younger woman, decides to put her misery to an end at the cost of her own life. Of the four of us, Cynthia was certainly the most likely to succeed. When she decided to do something, she just went right ahead and did it. It's not just the emotional betrayals that are so gutting, but the fact that all these women contributed materially to their husband's lives, only to be left to fend for themselves just as soon as they were counting on... You know what? I think Elise can explain it better than me. She probably gave Gil the best years of her life. Sacrificed her youth, always put herself last in order to bolster his ego, his drive, his ambition. And just as her dignity was hanging on by a thread, he just lopped it off by running off with some preschooler. I'm guessing. But when the three of them get to talking, they come to recognize their common oppressors, and before long, they decide they don't want to take these abuses lying down. All right, First Wives Club, we'll come to order. Starting the club was easy. Figuring out what to do next was considerably harder. What follows is a complex, multifaceted scheme to leverage their exes into giving up their ill-gotten gains by screwing them all over in various ways. But the key thing to remember here is that this isn't just some hell hath no fury thing. I mean, sure, they all have their petty little victories. Addictive sack of silicone! None of them abstain you from twisting the knife a little bit. You will receive a salary, which will keep you in the lifestyle to which I think you should become accustomed. But the whole point of their scheme, the object, the purpose, the ultimate goal, is not simply revenge. This is not about retaliation. This is not about negotiation. And this is not about men versus women. Yeah, well, what is it then? I'm getting sick of this, okay? Please don't make her mad. So, yeah. What is it about? What is the ultimate goal? Well, interestingly enough, the movie never gives it a name. But we will. After finally gaining leverage over all their ex-husbands, their one and only demand is to be financially compensated. What do we have to do? You have to pay. But not so that they can just drop it into their bank accounts. Annie, Elise, and Brenda use that money to bankroll a community center for women in distress. I know what this is called. You know what this is called? Mutual aid. Community organizing. Improving the material conditions of an underserved minority group. Now I hear some of you are like, Serge, are you really trying to do a class analysis on a movie with a cameo from Ivana Trump? And remember, what? Don't get mad, get everything. Don't get me wrong, it's not like I believe in the unquestioned magnanimity of charities. I actually think most of them exist not to improve society in any systemic way, but to simply launder the reputations of the ruling class. When you really stop and think about it, the more charities that exist, the more society has failed to meet the needs of its people. And as such, I consider pretty much every one of them some sort of policy failure. But with all that said, this is not charity. This money wasn't donated, it was seized. I know the movie isn't exactly preaching socialist theory. I washed the shorts, I ironed them, and I starched them. Oh, you did? Yeah, well, I mean, I supervised. And it's still way too easy for neoliberals to like. <laughs> they really are amazing women. But if you're only gonna interpret unquestionably leftist films through pro-leftist lenses, then you're only ever gonna be talking about two movies. Whereas here, I think there's a clear-cut argument to be made that they are, in fact, seizing power from the ruling class and then redistributing that power amongst those who don't have any. And I can enjoy that reading of the film at least half as much as the cast had making it. But so what does all this have to do with revenge? I mean, as it relates to the other two stories. Well, instead of blind rage, are trying to justify a failure to grieve with some canned rhetoric about punitive justice, Annie, Elise, and Brenda seek to improve the material conditions of their community, which is to say, they sought a form of restorative justice. What? what are we saying? What do we want? Revenge? No, we are not talking about revenge. No, I am talking about justice. Justice that isn't concerned with the mere algebra of violence. You know, a tooth for a tooth leaves the whole world toothless. But with the question of what would actually make society better 
in response to a particular injustice. Restorative justice doesn't simply assume that punishing the perpetrator is the best option, or even necessarily a requirement. No, 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 this is not a revenge thing. This is about justice. Halfway through this operation, we realized that the only people that would be helped by revenge would be us. And then we'd be no better than you. Happier, but no better. Punishment might make us feel good, but what does it actually change? Is it deterrence? Is deterrence the answer? Do harsher punishments reduce future crime? Other YouTubers have made whole videos about this, and I don't want to rehash all their arguments here, but suffice it to say that deterrence isn't really a verifiable phenomenon here on planet Earth. Harsher punishments do not coincide with reduced crime rates. They just don't. You can argue that they should. You can argue that you wish they did. But you can't argue that they do. And even if you don't want to get bogged down by all the statistics, which do tend to get pretty sticky pretty quickly, simply consider the well-worn fact that the United States is one of the most heavily policed countries in the world, and yet our crime rates are anything but comparable. So if your argument is that our whole justice system should be based on increasingly expensive, cruel, and elaborate forms of punishment, on the unverifiable basis that it'll reduce crime further down the road, you are lying. Or you're kidding yourself. You couldn't fact check whether or not you need to take a dump. Sorry you had to find out this way. And if the point of punitive justice isn't to reduce or prevent future crime, then what is the actual point? I propose a new term for punitive justice. Vibes-based justice. You feel the perpetrator should be punished, regardless of what effect it actually has on society. Whereas restorative justice is concerned with the actual material conditions of the community that suffered the injustice, which is to say, addressing the root causes of injustice itself. Well, Serge, Annie, Elise, and Brenda were in a privileged position to think like that. After all, unlike Ed Harley or Ellie Williams, the injustice that they faced wasn't murder. Tell me what to do! Oh no? Somebody did die though. But Annie, Elise, and Brenda's solution wasn't to simply punish the perpetrators. It was to make sure that people in similar situations never have to go through what they did. A very dear friend of ours died from neglect. And you're going to help us make very sure that that never happens again. Something to keep in mind here, one last thing, is that I'm not judging any of these stories or their protagonists for the specific kind of recompense that each of them seeks. Whether they want vigilante vengeance, punitive justice, or true restorative change, these are all fantastic stories about grief, anger, and despair. And my heart breaks for each and every one of the heroes, who are all suffering incalculable loss. When we suffer incalculable loss, I think we all spend a little time in Ed, Ellie, and Elise's shoes. None of them are wrong to feel the things they feel. They might not even be wrong to do the things they do. Ultimately though, it's not my job to judge. It's only my job to understand. Similarly, I don't think it's any story's job to judge its main characters for us. The only job any story ever ultimately has is to entertain, which a lot of revenge stories do. But where so many of them quickly devolve into simple reactionary power fantasies, these three stories invite us to consider more of the dynamics at play, and ultimately, to practice our empathy in ways that this genre rarely encourages. Go. Oh. Take him. <laughs> to the lost. I don't think I can ever forgive you for that. But I would like to try. for an eye leaves the whole world blind.
A tooth for a tooth leaves the whole world toothless. A tit for a tat leaves the whole world 